This is Invest Talk. Independent thinking, shared success. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley stand ready to take your finance and investment questions and share their unbiased answers. Invest Talk is made possible by KPP Financial, a registered investment advisor firm serving clients throughout the United States. The clarity for your path forward starts now. Here is KPP Chief Executive Officer, Financial Advisor, Justin Klein. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Monday, March 6th, 2023 edition, and we are well into March and almost into the end of the first quarter now. And I'm Justin Klein. I'm excited for this hour with you, answering your finance and investment questions, helping you define your strategy and do that by making good, consistent decisions with your money. Now, for those of you that are new to Invest Talk, let me show you that I'm always careful to give you my straight and unbiased answers to those questions that you bring to the table. And no hidden agenda. The only agenda here is what's on your mind. You push it. You push the agenda here on Invest Talk with your questions. I have things that I want to talk about, but ultimately, your voice is most important, not mine. I know you hear my voice or Steve's voice, but yours is the most important. So, you know, the investing situation right now is is challenging. It's a it's a new paradigm for even the most seasoned investors. And you know, I've been doing this 20 plus years, and frankly, the majority of that time has been in a different regime. The last time we saw this regime was really early in my career, right? Uh, where you had the tech bubble bursting and valuations revaluing lower, and you're seeing the same thing right now. And it usually takes time. It takes time for people to get despondent. Uh, and, and I think we're still in the hope phase for a lot of people that were burned for, uh, over, the, over the last call it 18 months that are still enamored with the sexy stories. And that's an environment that's difficult to navigate if you don't have that longer term perspective. And so so we try to bring you is some perspective, some data, and helping you keep your eye on what matters the most. Not your hopes of what the world would be. We all hope that the technologies of the day would solve all our problems. But the reality is it has its drawbacks. It has its negative things, obviously, that uh, we can all see it, you know, that social media and such is kind of done to the way we all interact. And so what's important is to have a clear view of the trends that are in place and the trends that are economical. I said this before, if you... If I went on the corner and I sold dollars for 90 cents, I'd have a huge line out the door, but that's not economical. Okay. So it's important to understand what is a flash in the pan and what is sustainable. And our job is to get your portfolio, your strategy into a sustainable trend. So my focus point today concerns the story behind this headline. The U.S. factory orders have declined, but should we be concerned? We're going to look at the ISM management report last week that manufacturing, which accounts for only about 11% of the economy, and I think that's the biggest takeaway here, it's 11% of the economy. It's not a huge part, and it it draws a lot of headlines, uh, but it's important for understanding that part of the economy, not the economy really as a whole. But we're going to look into it because it does impact different sectors. Now, time permitting, I do want to touch on a few other things. One is in regards to robotics. How how will robotics shape 
a deglobalizing world. Also, BREIT, the Blackstone REIT, uh, new news on how redemptions went last month. We're going to look at that. And then lastly, perks. I want it's more of a personal finance thing. And a lot of people fall in love with the perks of a credit card. Well, there are drawbacks to that as well. So we're going to look at that. Also, have some voice bank questions ready to play. Also have some calls on Cresco Labs as well as Treasury Bills and an iTunes review question on top of my perspective today about oil prices that we'll get to about halfway through the show. Now we've got this all planned for this hour, so uh, action-packed, and I'm ready to take your live calls as well. 8 at 8 99 chart is how you get through and ask your question on today's show. Now let's take a look at the markets. Uh, the broad indices were down slightly uh, after... Kind of a positive morning. We we pulled back for, for most of the day. Small caps really took it on the chin, though. Small caps are down 1.35% on the day. So interesting weakness there. And maybe that has a lot to do with the manufacturing side because the manufacturing side is concentrated more on those smaller cap names. Uh, but interesting kind of note there. So it was a, it was a pretty mixed uh, picture. Treasuries were a bit weaker, although they were higher earlier in the day. The 210 spread moved to negative 90 basis points. That's that's the most inverted it's been since 1981. The dollar was weaker uh, on the day. Gold finished unchanged. Bitcoin was uh, down slightly. Crude oil, WTI, was up about 1% after a 4% bounce last week. So you got a little fall through there. You had some... Yeah, that's, that was pretty much it. So kind of a, a mixed to, to down day in the markets. Now let's go to our first listener question now. Hey, Stephen, Justin, longtime listener. Just curious your opinion on ticker IIPR. I'm looking to add some additional REIT exposure to my portfolio. And I've had my eye on this for, for quite a while, nearly a year. I've been watching it and just curious what you think at these levels hovering right around the low 80s with a pretty decent earnings report that just recently came out. Look forward to hearing it on the podcast. Thanks again. Bye. All right. Industrial Properties Read. This is a name we own for clients. So we, we like it. They own a bunch of uh, cannabis facilities, cannabis grow facilities. And uh, it's down recently because the growth is slow. They've had a, uh, they've had one or two defaults on their uh, their property on their on their uh, leases, uh, but that's to be expected in uh, kind of a highly lucrative uh, market like this. But they've been recently acquiring uh, new properties, and they're still growing. Last quarter funds from operation were still up fifteen percent year over year. Revenues were up twenty percent year over year. Now that is slowing from over a hundred percent in revenue growth back in mid twenty twenty one. So you can see that deceleration, and that's why it's come down. But to, to us, in our mind, it's come down far too much because it's trading at about 10 times funds from operation if you look forward, which is way, way, way too cheap. So uh, it's definitely a higher risk name, but in our mind, especially down here, it is worth it. So that was IIPR, industrial, innovative industrial, excuse me, innovative industrial properties. All right, now the stock market is constantly shifting, and that probably means you have questions about how your ideas and your portfolio fit into this new regime. So I'm sure you have finance and investment questions that you'd like answered on Invest Talk. You set the agenda, like I said at the top of the show. Phone lines are ready for you right now at 888 chart. In today's world, a variety of factors are affecting the stock markets. Serious investors know building a secure financial future requires hard work and determination. That's why now, more than ever, when it comes to the planning, execution, and maintenance of your portfolio, you need InvestTalk. With total downloads surpassing 50 million, each InvestTalk podcast should be one of your key financial planning and educational tools. InvestTalk is a free download. And hosts Justin Klein and Steve Peasley stand ready to provide their unbiased guidance and professional analysis developed from real-time data research and years of investing experience. 24-7, 
rain or shine, during smooth sailing or on rough weather days, the Invest Talk listener line is open and waiting for your questions. You set the agenda. Don't forget to call Invest Talk 888-99-CHART. No two portfolios are alike, and every investor has a unique set of circumstances. So don't forget to call Invest Talk 888-99 Chart. Let's go to Alberto in San Jose. Looking at D I V. You own it or looking to buy it? Hello, Justin. Thank you for taking my call. I own it. I hold a very small position, less than one percent. Uh, I'm looking at long term investing. Uh, just purchase it and and uh, continue to uh, receive the dividends. Should I add to the position? What do you think about uh, this ETF? Okay, this is DIV, the Global X Super Dividend ETF. What's interesting here is Morningstar has it as a one out of five stars and they have a negative view of it. So that's one little red flag there. Now the portfolio itself is... Definitely leading small cap value, so I like that. Now, you always want to look at all of these things in in context. Uh, whereas last year it was in the nineteenth percentile, pretty good, but over the past decade it's been kind of the lower percentile because growth has been outperforming. So I don't put a lot of weight here in that morning star rating because they're looking over the last ten years and they're saying, well, it hasn't performed very well. Well, that's because it was. Leaning on the value side where the market, the, the growth side was outperforming, but that's starting to shift. Now, one worry for me, though, is this year is it's in the lower percentile. But once again, a year where so far growth has outperformed. Um, you know, my biggest issue here is that these are all I look at the top 10 holdings, B&G Foods, Genco Shipping and Trading, San Jose Basin Royalty Trust, which is uh, an oil royalty trust. You have a few MLPs in here. You have Chesapeake, Iron Mountain, a REIT, Abvi. Uh, none of these, to me, are that exciting. Uh, and they have a lot of debt on their balance sheet. And that probably worries me the most, is that these are mostly highly levered companies. So this is a good example of, hey, I like large, small cap value, but you can execute small cap value in a smart way, or you can execute it in... Uh, a not so smart way. Uh, and this to me is executing it poorly. Uh, and so I would be I would be moving off of it. Uh, I think you just do better owning a regular small cap value ETF of some kind, where it's more broadly diversified. I said this before, you know, people get a little bit too caught up in dividends. And especially when you have a title like super dividend, you just people it's it's a marketing ploy. It's even trademarked. If you look at it, it's a super dividend and has a, a trademark symbol. Um, so it's clever, it's marketed well, um, but I don't love the longer or short term performance uh, really overall. And I don't like these names uh, in the top 10. So I would move off of it and find something else. And don't once again fall into love, too in love with uh, that dividend. Now, when people take the time to leave an Invest Talk review on iTunes, we'd like to thank them for the courtesy by getting to their questions quickly. Luke NYC77 says, I have learned a lot from Justin and Steve over the last three years. I'd like to add Disney, Google, and Amazon to my son's portfolio. He is a minor, and it would be for at least 10 to 15 years. Please advise if there's a good purchase at current prices or if dollar cost averaging is a good option as well. Well, All of these names are struggling to a degree right now. And for mainly because they were overvalued and that valuation is is coming back in. Disney still trades, at least it trades at a reasonable valuation now. It was trading at $200 per share when everyone was hooked on Disney Plus and they thought that was going to be a huge growth driver. And to a degree, it has, but not lived up to the hype. Let's just say that. So at $100 per share, I think it's fairly valued. I wouldn't say it's expensive or cheap at these levels. So that one, I think you're okay. Uh, Google, that one has a lot of regulatory and technological risk with ChatGPT, 
you have regulatory risk around uh, how they use customer data, uh, et cetera. So I worry a, a bit about, about Google. Um, and then Amazon, that's probably my least favorite out of all of these, uh, just because they benefited so much from globalization and that's reversing. So if I'm going to put these in a list of order, I'm going to put Disney one, Google two, Amazon three. Now everybody wants to build a comfortable financial future, but along the way you'll have to find it. You'll, you'll all find it to invest some questions and now's a good time to call. So give invest talk a call at 888 chart. Each day, Invest Talk listeners submit their finance and investment questions via phone or email. Would you like your question to be put near the top of the list? Just take a minute or two to leave a review and rating for Invest Talk at iTunes. And be sure to include a brief question with your iTunes review comments. And my focus point concerns the story behind this headline. U.S. factory orders have declined, and this was for the month of February, and they were down about 1.6%. Uh, Reuters had expected them to be down about 1.8%, and manufacturing really has been undermined a bit over the last year, and year and a half, by a strong dollar. You have to realize that, that not only are U.S. manufacturers producing for companies domestically, but they're exporting. We do export. We're, we are one of the largest manufacturers in the world. Yes, we keep that internally, but we manufacture a lot of things for the rest of the world. It doesn't sound like it. You'll never hear that really printed, but that's facts. And so when you have a stronger dollar, it makes our products globally more expensive. And so Strong dollar is negative for manufacturers. So while appreciation is cooled, you've seen that kind of pull back in the fourth quarter, a little bit of strength so far this year, that has softened global demand in general, just that nice 10% uh, increase of the last uh, year or so. Now, this sounds like really, sounds really bad, but if you actually look underneath the hood, it was a pretty decent report. Now, factory orders dropped 13.3% from month over month. That was up 16% in December. But transportation equipment weighed down mostly 54% drop in civilian aircrafts. Orders for things like machinery, that was up 1.6%. Bookings for computers and electronic products, that rose about 0.6%. Orders for electrical equipment, appliances, components, all surged 1.3%. You also saw gains in things like primary metals, fabricated metals, etc. So non-defense capital goods, which excludes aircrafts, you actually saw, and that really reflects business spending plans on equipment, that was up 0.8%. And... Core capital goods, which are used to calculate business equipment in the GDP uh, calculation, that increased 1.1%. So it just goes to show you that you can't really just focus on the headlines because underneath the hood, if you just exclude that weird dynamic with uh, aviation, this has been, this is still a, a manufacturing sector that has increasing demand, not in a big way but it's clearly not showing a recessionary environment. It continues to be a slow growth environment with some sectors doing better, some sectors doing worse, but overall manufacturing is on decent footing. So don't, uh, don't get too caught up in those headlines. All right, now let's grab another caller question now at 888-99-CHART. Hi, Stephen, Justin. I have a question regarding T-bills. I was looking at the 26-week T-bill that is earning almost 5% and was looking to put that in to my retirement account. And one option they offer is if I want to reinvest, but I plan to use the interest later on that it earns for income. I'm not in a high bracket, 
So just wondering, how do you know if it would be good to reinvest or just wait till it matures and invest in another term? I'll be listening to the answer on your show. Thank you. Well, I definitely wouldn't reinvest and make that decision today. Right? You can go buy it and you get your money after the six months and you go reinvest it if you want to or you go do something else with it. So there's no real upside. You're not losing out on anything um, to reinvest because they're going to reinvest it at whatever rate is at that time. So, you know, it could shift. You can see the six-month T-bill in six months at 3%. Right, if the Fed starts an easing cycle, for example, by the fourth quarter. So they are fairly attractive at that 5% rate. No credit risk. But no, after six months, that could change. So there's no reason to uh, sit there and reinvest the capital when you don't know what rate you're going to get in six months. Thanks for the call. Now let's touch a bit on the B REIT, Blackstone REIT. And they said on Wednesday that they blocked investors from cashing out of their $71 billion income trust, real estate investment trust. This is a private REIT. Talked about this really since uh, November was when the first time they couldn't fund their, their withdrawals. And in February, they fulfilled $1.4 billion of the $30.9 billion of total withdrawal requests for the month. So about 35% of it. And total B read exemption requests in February were 26% lower than they were in January. So even with lower redemption requests, they were they still couldn't meet them. Credit Suisse downgraded Blackstone stock, and then the stock was down 43% last year because they get a lot of fees from uh, this type, this fund. And it just goes to show you that these private investments are illiquid. They're not very transparent. You don't know what you what what it's worth, what you're going to get out of it, um, and so it's something that's underappreciated when people are looking at investments is liquidity and transparency. And that's one great thing about equities in the marketplace. You know exactly what's trading at today. You can know exactly what you can sell it for right now. Now the next and best talk. Oh, we're getting to a break. So give me a call now at eight 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 nine 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 chart. One of the most rewarding things I do each weekday is host the Invest Talk podcast. I truly enjoy helping investors, and I know that every question counts and every answer I provide will be unbiased. You, the caller, get to chart the course for each Invest Talk podcast. Call with your questions anytime, day or night, 888 99Chart. Now, you probably noticed that Steve and I are very excited about having reached. 50 million podcast downloads. Now to celebrate, KPP Financial is giving away 50 free subscriptions to the KPP Premium Newsletter. This is our 50 for 50 million thank you to you for helping us exceed that 50 million mark. Now, if you'd like a chance to win a free newsletter subscription, just go follow and best talk on one of our social platforms, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And be sure to like and tag three friends on our 50 for 50 post. It's that easy. We'll be picking 10 winners each week for the next four weeks. We picked 10 last week. We're going to pick another 10 again later this week. So once again, follow Invest Talk and tell, also tell your friends. Uh, remember, the prize is one year's free subscription to the KPP Premium Newsletter. And it brings you financial news and commentary from me and Steve. And KPP Premium Newsletter will normally cost you $199 per year, but you might get it for free. Once again, just follow Invest Talk on social media platforms like Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and like and tag free friends on the 50 for 50 million post. Now let's swing back to the Invest Talk Voice Bank for a question that came in earlier from New Hampshire. Good afternoon, Steve and Justin. Steve Ogier calling in from a snowy Concord, New Hampshire. Just wanted to check in on a stock that I've owned for about two years now, Fresco Labs, D-R-L-B-F. I did buy it when the fundamentals looked pretty strong, but technically it's just getting beat down this this market that we're currently in. I did buy a half position, so I'm thinking maybe I might double down on this, but I wanted to check in and see what you guys thought before I did that. It looks like they did have a recent acquisition. Maybe that's fueling the downward trend. Uh, Like I said, before I want to put more into this, I want to see what you think, if it is worth it. 
And then a follow-up question in general on investing in individual stocks. Is it beneficial to dollar cost average entities over the future? Would you prefer doing that? Or maybe looking at the fundamentals and picking or technicals and or both, picking a time that works better or is opportunistic to do so. Just want to see what you guys think on that. So uh, dollar cost averaging versus one time lump sum and what you think of Cresco. Thanks. Well, let me let me tackle the last part first. Obviously, being more proactive, understanding the fundamentals, understanding the technicals are going to help you get into a stock at a more opportune time. Whereas dollar cost averaging kind of helps you get in over time and do it unemotionally. Uh, most people, when you know the stock's down, they feel pretty negative about it. And they tend to not add when that's usually the better time to add. And vice versa. And so I would encourage you to either have the time and, and, and be proactive if you can, but some people can, and that's fine. If you don't have the time, you're working, you have kids, you have a family, you have an active lifestyle, etc. You can't, it's not, this isn't your job, right? It's very difficult to really get the timing correctly. So for most people, for most people, the dollar cost averaging approach is probably going to be better for them. For a professional who's skilled, et cetera, having a more scrutinizing eye on the fundamentals, on the technicals, on the economic backdrop, et cetera, they can do better. But it takes a lot of work. So it just depends on you know, the frame of mind and, and, and your lifestyle and your, your ability. And you have to be honest with yourself. Now, with Cure or Cresco Labs, excuse me, and this is a cannabis company. They're a vertically integrated multi-state cannabis operator, grows, manufactures, distributes cannabis using uh, CPG uh, goods. The firm sells its products through wholesale and company on retail channels in numerous states. Here's my issue with it is I don't love this part of the business. It's a business that is exciting. There's a lot of new entrants to it. It's still evolving from a legal standpoint. And a couple of years ago, there's a lot of hype around the, the sector as a whole. But what type of... I'll go back to uh, Philip Morris. I, I had this example on the show last week, and I was talking about how Philip Morris has been able to carve out this incredible incredible business over many decades. And a big part of that is there aren't a lot of people going out there, a lot of companies in boardrooms saying, let's get into the cigarette business. And so that's left Philip Morris and, and, and you know, a handful of cigarette makers. They've been able to extract consistent margins and profits and cash flow over many decades. Now contrast that to this business that's very new, there's a lot of new entrants. There's a lot of people saying, oh, cannabis is going to be the next big thing. It's going to grow. It's, you know, but the question is, that's difficult to make money in. Can you be profitable in such a saturated market? If you think of the cannabis space, is there a brand name that stands out? That if you think of cannabis type products, that is the name within the industry? No, not really. There's a bunch of brands that are out there and they're all trying to get their foothold. They're all trying to sell the same way, right? Wholesale through cannabis dispensaries and things like that. And it's a cutthroat business. It's a difficult business. So I rather own... If you're going to own, you know, get exposure to the space, you want something that's a bit protected, right? If you have a license to sell cannabis in a particular area, you're one of maybe a handful. And so you have maybe not a stranglehold, but you're just, you can maintain your margins probably because there's only a handful of alternatives in the marketplace. And so dispensaries, I think are pretty good businesses. Because the dispensaries have 
cross the difficult part, the hurdle of getting licensed. Whereas the cons- the actual goods, it's pretty commoditized. And so that's why I'd pass on Cresco. Now, the next invest talk, the story behind this question. Can we expect a rough road ahead for an undervalued stock market? Now, after posting extraordinary strong returns at the start of the year, the stock market retreated in February. And we'll get to that story tomorrow. But for now, I'm Justin Klein. I'm ready to take your questions now at 8 at 8 99 chart. Now, let's pivot over to the, the robot market and how that fits into deglobalization. And this is frankly the part of the tech world, I would say has the, is the most grounded in reality. It's the most grounded in reality because there's true applications for it. There are demographics behind the need for automation. You have the political winds pushing companies to reshore manufacturing. And factory automation has always looked like the future. But in the world of Cold War type tensions, it's forcing a big reset in the manufacturing space. You have things like the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips and Science Act that were passed last year. And we enter this year really with China and the U.S. having clear and really opposing industrial policies. And you have new terms like reshoring, nearshoring, friendshoring. It's all part of the geopolitical landscape. And in the business community, the consensus is to play along. And a lot of it is to say, hey, okay, we'll do that if you give us generous incentives. And that's a lot of what those bills last year were to do. So they're saying we're getting incentives to do this. We're solidifying our supply chain we're bringing that back home that's good politically and it's good for the stability of our sourcing to create shorter and less globalized supply chains and frankly geopolitics are in the driving seat and and as long as that is the case global manufacturing will just have to go along And there'll be pressure on companies to build multiple supply chains, reduce dependency on China. And it's going to create new constraints on the ability to chase cheap labor all across the world, which has been really the the mantra of corporate America for the past, or corporate world, shall you say, for the last 30 years. And one of the big beneficiaries of this is actually going to be Japan. Why? Because the demographic problem that China is dealing with right now, Japan was dealing with it 25 years ago. And there are companies like Funak and factory automation giant Kiantz. And Kiantz is now the country's second most valuable company behind Toyota. And it's on the cutting edge of, it's really Japan's cutting industrial edge. An export volume of industrial robots from Japan to the U.S. hit a record level last year. It was up 18% to $2.38 billion. Now, who buys these robots? U.S. auto industry mainly. But it's shifting towards other industries like semiconductors, food, and metal production. And the global market for machine vision, which that's what a lot of these... Robots are doing, right? There's machine vision here. Cameras, sensors, readers that that empower them. They reached 16.9 billion last year. And the forecast is for it to exceed 40 billion by the end of the decade. So if you want to get excited about tech, by far, to me, the sexiest place to invest is the robotic space. Now, Steve Pease and I have been telling you for a while now that we are in a new market regime. Cycles are a natural part of almost everything in life. And the stock market is no different, right? Equity markets are no different. Bond markets are no different. 
We've talked about it before that bond markets tend to go in 30 year cycles, 30 years down in yields and 30 years up in yields. And we just started that 30 year up. All right. So those are longer term cycles and there's shorter term cycles like bull and bear markets, recessions and booms. And serious investors need to understand that you have to adjust to these cycles to fit the times. Don't have the memory of an elephant. Or I guess you would have a memory of an elephant. Do elephants have long memories, right? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you want a memory of the elephant. You want to be looking back decades in time. So you can not get caught off side. Don't be the last one to recognize it. So if you need help recognizing if your portfolio is on side, I encourage you to reach out to myself or Steve at our company, KPP Financial, where we practice the same philosophy, which is independent thinking and shared success. And we provide unbiased guidance, both on and off air. And we practice parallel investing, which means we invest right alongside our clients. So that means you can set up a free portfolio review assessment with me via telephone or go to meeting. Just send us a message through investtalk.com. Just click on the portfolio review button right at the top. Now, the sooner you contact us, the sooner we can help you get your portfolio optimized. Now, next up, another listener question here on Invest Talk. So hang on. Mark your calendar for Wednesday, March 22nd from 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific time. You are invited to a new KPP Financial Wealth Webinar, Value Investing positioning your portfolio for profitability, relative price, and dividend payments. Be sure to tell your friends and family members about the new KPP Financial Wealth Webinar. It's free, and you can register now at investtalk.com. Hi, I'm calling today about Buckle. I'm up a lot on this stock. Thanks to you guys for showing me this company, which I've never heard of before. I'm wondering, after it paid its nice special dividend, um, it's been slowly dropping since. I'm wondering if you think it's going to continue dropping. It is at some support, or if you think it's just consolidating, and if you guys took any profits and what you plan on doing with the stock. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right, looking at Buckle, and we have owned this for a while when it was down in the 20s, and it rallied up to about 50. We did trim a little bit up there, but... Uh, it has pulled back since, and it's now in the high 30s. And it is at some pretty good support here, right around uh, the 37 mark. It's also the 200-day moving average. Uh, there, They had some preliminary same-source sales numbers that were a bit weaker than, than expected, so that's why you had this recent drop. Uh, but overall, we still, we still like it. Uh, it's supposed to earn nearly $5 per share this year and next year. And it's trading at $37 per share. So we like it. Like you said, they're paying a special dividend. And they actually pay a special dividend all the time. Because this business just continues to spin off cash and produce cash and cash flow. Uh, and so we're, we're fans of it. Uh, we think this is actually a, a nice buying area in the high 30s on this recent pullback. So I'm going to give Buckle a thumbs up. And for everyone else out there, if you don't know what they do, they're a retailer. Casual apparel, footwear, accessories. They have a, a loyal, loyal client base. And they're not big, only about $1.8 billion market cap, but there's a dividend yield of, uh, in the mid threes, which doesn't sound huge, but it's consistent and it's growing and they pay special dividends and their return equity is very high. Right now, 62%, long term, it averages about 36%. So it's just very, very profitable and we like the business. Now, this in, this is Invest Talk. I'm Justin Klein, and we have one goal here is to help you achieve your own version of financial freedom. And our work continues after this final break. So if you're going to call, you want to do that right now at 888 99 Chart. Justin Klein is here and ready to take your calls live. Invest Talk, 888 Chart. Hi, Steve and Justin. I was wondering, I have a position in Fidelity Inflation Protected Bond Index, symbol FIPDX. I'm down just about 10% in it. 
And with the Fed continuing to raise interest rates, I'm wondering if I should just cut my losses and get out of it. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. All right, this is the Fidelity Inflation Protection Bond Index, and it's basically just owning tips. And that's what you're having exposure to, average duration, about 6.6 years. So medium, intermediate duration. And I think the bigger question is, what's your alternative? It's really what it is. What else are you going to put this in? Uh, I think you can get better yield elsewhere. Current yield on this is, it looks high, but that's because where inflation has been. Uh, but the price has uh, clearly declined. And if you look at the performance so far this year, let's take a quick look. Come on, Morningstar, there we go. 2021, it did fairly well, up about 6%, but last year down 12%, only 1.3% this year. Yeah, I mean, this is not a name that I would, I don't love the tips market, let's just say that. Uh, the amount of inflation that is priced in here is a lot lower than what I think reality will be. And so owning it right here won't be that great. You want to own it when the inflation that's built into it is very high, not when it's very low. So I'm going to I'm going to pass. Uh, I think you should move off of this name. You should be finding something that has better yield. Uh, and frankly, I think equities are going to be better, a better hedge against inflation. To me, tips are safe, a safe hedge against inf inflation, but it's probably one of the worst hedges against inflation. I rather own I bonds, for example. I think that's going to be a better uh, place if you want something that's super safe. So that's one better option if you want to stay kind of uh, government, uh, but things like corporate bonds, high yield bonds, those are going to be better hedged against inflation. Right. Now, lastly, let's talk a little bit about credit cards and credit card issuers are offering huge incentives right now to lure new customers, travel points, cash back, other perks. And for some people, this is a way to make it you feel good about rising prices. And this has also created a situation. There's an uptick in the number of people struggling to make payments on their credit card, the Federal Reserve says. And this week, DoorDash and Chase unveiled a new co-branded credit card for those that use the delivery service a lot. And the average APR is between 19 and a half and 28 and a quarter percent. But the average, average rate right now on credit cards is at, at a little over 19%. This goes to show you that those, those rewards credit cards, they come with a higher interest rate. Okay. So if you're using them, you need to use them very carefully. And this is really the point here is that credit cards can be very useful for perks, cash back. I mean, I have a personal one. I have perks. I have uh, Amex Platinum. I get the perks. Uh, I get points, all of that, and I pay it off every month, right? Don't pay any interest. Same with business. We have a business card and we get perks for, you know, spending all, buying all the things that we need to do uh, to, to, to buy to, to run our business. And that is a good use of credit cards. But soon people get caught up in those and they take one step forward and then two steps back when they're paying 18, 19, 25% interest. And according to bank rate survey, only 54% of cardholders pay their balance in full each month. So it's all depends on how you use them. And revolving credit is a flexible way to build your credit, buy more important things like a home and a car. Just make sure that you're among those that are able to pay it in full and avoid the interest payment very crucial that you don't have that habit of paying interest of almost any kind. Right? The only interest you really should pay is on your home. Maybe your car, if you're leasing it for business purposes, something like that. But your mortgage is, is really all you should be um, paying interest on. 
Now, I'm Justin Klein. This completes another Invest Talk program. Steve Peasley and I thank you for listening. And we encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And be sure to rate and review. And remember to follow the Invest Talk account on social media Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And you might win a free subscription to the KPP Premium Newsletter. We're giving away, once again, 10 free annual subscriptions each week for the next four weeks. All you have to do is like and tag three friends in our 50 for 50 million posts. Independent thinking showed success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice. Or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security? Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. InvestTalk is a copyrighted program of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor firm which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, call 1-800-557-5461. Steve Peasley is president and Justin Klein is chief executive officer of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial.